So the, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is uh, the rotator cuff. And really, I'm, I'm mostly talking about uh, arthroscopy and how it's changed orthopedics and, and what we've done. And I'm sort of going to use the rotator cuff and shoulder surgery as the vehicle to talk about this. Um, so uh, the real question that I think is still unanswered for all of us is, are we really getting more for less with arthroscopy or with minimally invasive surgeries? Um, and the title of the talk, America's Cup to the Rotator Cuff, uh, I, I think I can pull this together before we're finished uh, with the end of the evening. So um, this kind of stems from questions that get asked to me frequently by patients that I see in the office. And, and these things uh, are, are fairly reasonable questions and, and questions I think that, that intelligent people ask. And, and some people think they know the answers and other people know they know the answers. And, and, and very few people actually really do know the answers. And, and these things are what is the rotator cuff and, and how does it function? Or if your rotator cuff is torn, do you actually need to get it repaired or fixed? Will I heal faster if I have surgery uh, through, the arthroscopy, you know, through arthroscopy or for the rotator cuff? And are my incisions always going to be smaller? Are, is my problem or are problems that are big appropriate to be treated uh, through the arthroscope? And are the results of arthroscopic treatment for, for procedures as good as the good old standards? Well, what is the rotator cuff? I mean, this is a, an essential thing. And, and in some ways, the name is misleading. The, the most simplest way to think about it is it's just a series of four muscles. They're called the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. They surround the shoulder joint uh, beneath all the, the bigger muscles that we see around the shoulder that show up topographically on your shoulder. So when you're looking at a person's shoulder, you're actually not looking at the rotator cuff muscles. You're looking at the deltoid, the pectoralis, the latissimus, the large kind of muscle building muscles that we think about as being around the shoulder. In, in evolution, if you believe in evolution or in creation, if you're in that camp, we've really traded uh, stability in the shoulder for mobility. And that's why the shoulder is the most frequently dislocated joint in the body. It, it, it's the joint that has the most range of motion of any other joint in the body. But the trade-off for that is that it's not a very stable joint. The function of the rotator cuff uh, is to actually try and keep the head uh, centered in the glenoid of the, the cuff, the, the head being the, the top of the humerus where the, the, uh, the top of the arm bone is, the glenoid being the name for the socket that is what, uh, on the shoulder blade. All of the sports and activities that we do, and particularly overhead sports, have one thing in common, which is that the large muscles, like the deltoid muscle you see here, and the pectoralis muscle that comes across the front of the joint, and the latissimus across the back of the joint, have the common uh, uh, functional uh, problem, if you will, that they tend to want to displace this head, this round head, up and down, forward and backwards, or inferiorly in the socket of the joint. The function of the rotator cuff is that it's a series of muscles that th the sole function really is to keep the ball part of uh, that's attached to the head centered on this socket while the bigger muscles act to move the arm through space. And that's essentially it. They're called the rotator cuff muscles because they do assist in rotation, that is movements to the side back and forth of the arm. But for the most part, what they really do and where problems arise is when the ball is not being centered in the socket, essentially. The rotator cuff fails in many different ways. And, and things that cause rotator cuff tears uh, can be many different things, from a simple trauma or, or one event like a car accident to attritional injuries or injuries of overuse that just occur by micro trauma or, or multiple events that hurt it. The, there are sort of two theories about how this occurs, and it's sort of a chicken or the egg thing. One theory is the theory of attrition, that people get undersurface tears in the cuff because of impingement or, or because they, they're working hard and some of the fibers begin to fail. What then happens as fibers begin to fail is that the remaining fibers have to do the work of the cuff, and those fibers are under greater stress, and then those fail. And eventually you propagate into a cuff, or into, a, excuse me, a cuff tear. The second way to think about it is uh, an impingement type of uh, pathology. With impingement, the idea is that the cuff, for some reason, is not functioning correctly, and the head is moving up and down and forward and backward in the joint. And as it does this, it's rubbing on the bony roof or the acromion uh, over the shoulder. And that rubbing or that friction, that actual physical 
uh, uh, friction is causing a breakdown of the cuff uh, musculature. And again, uh, the same process can occur. In reality, uh, the cuff tears are probably caused as a, a compromise or as a combination of, of these two different types of uh, forces and, and things. So it's actually true that an effectively functioning rotator cuff is essential to normal painless shoulder function. You need to have cuff function that, that uh, is, is working and keeping that ball centered. And if not, generally people have shoulder pain. But repairing a torn rotator cuff is a totally different thing. We've got multiple studies now which have looked at people who don't have any shoulder pain and have normal shoulder function, but gotten MRIs or ultrasounds or studies on them and found that they have cuff tears. Some people even have rather large cuff tears, but perfectly normal shoulder function. Interestingly, uh, Ken Yamaguchi uh, in St. Louis did a study where he looked at people who had a cuff tear on one side of the body and just for kicks got an ultrasound on the other side to see if they had a cuff tear over there. And many of them did. He followed these cuffs and found that about 51% of these patients would become symptomatic on the side that they, they had previously no symptoms on after an average of 2.8 years. But you have to remember this is a biased population because just by virtue of the fact that they've had one symptomatic cuff tear, they may be at an increased risk for having a second cuff tear. So actually, having a rotator cuff tear does not mean that you need to have surgery. And I think that's, it's wrong for people to tell patients that, that you, you've got a cuff tear and we've got to fix it or you're going to get arthritis that's going to take you down the wrong road. There's a, there's a population of patients where that's true, but in general, if you have a painless shoulder and good function, who cares if you have a cuff tear? That's something to get excited about. And you've all sat through some of the, the anatomy here and things like that, so we're going to talk about something different here that I get excited about, which is sailing. I don't know if anyone else here is a sailor or if anybody can name the boat that you see on the right side of the screen or uh, that the poem on the left is written about. The clue is that it's 1850. The other clue is that there's a large, shiny object that's named after this boat. It is, in fact, the America. The, the America actually started as a boat, and I promise you I'll try and get this back to rotator cuff surgery, but it started uh, as, as sort of part of a wager to the New York Yacht Club. The English Yacht Club, uh, uh, the Royal uh, Yacht Squadron actually in England, had um, been wagering on a lot of high-priced uh, uh, races. Back in the 1800s and, and maybe now still, um, there was a lot of betting that surrounded yacht racing. Well, they came up with what they thought was a reasonably good challenge, which is that they had a huge money pot uh, and bragging rights for any boat that could come and win a race around the Isle of Wight. The second thing is that the, the 74 mile uh, tour around the Isle of Wight is in some of the most riptide, hazardous, rocky waters uh, with strange currents and things like that. And the race hugely favored the British ships that were competing. Well, the New York Yacht Club commissioned a boat to be built by a boat builder named Stevens. And he built a boat that was 101 feet long, really huge actually, even by that day's standards, 23 feet wide. It drew 11 feet of water. It had 5,263 square feet of sail, which was just an enormous amount by the day's standards compared to the size of the boat. And it cost them, in the end, $20,000 to have it built. In fact, the boat cost about $30,000 to be designed and built. But part of their commission to Stevens was that the boat had to beat any boat in America before it went over. And there was one boat named the Maria that was actually able to, to beat uh, the America before it left, although it wasn't seaworthy enough to get over to England. So they bargained with Stevens. They got the boat for $20,000 on a steal, and they took it over to race. Well, what happened, it was really, uh, this boat was sort of a triumph of technology. And for better or for worse, a lot of the design ideas came from sort of unscrupulous things um, that, that had to do with the slaving ships at the time. So this, this boat had a flat stern, a sharp hollow bow that actually cut water instead of just pushing it out of the way, high mast rake, which made the sails efficient, and they used cotton rather than flax in the sails. A lot of triumph, a lot of things that were, were really changed and somewhat radical in the industry back in the, at the time. Well, they went to cows and they destroyed the competition. It, it, and it was a sound victory for, for the American uh, uh, Yacht Club there. They actually renamed the cup, the America's Cup, and it stayed that. It was one of the, uh, uh, perhaps the, the longest running uh, legacy of a, of a single one sports event. I think the America held the cup into the 1980s when Dennis Con Connor lost it. 
Well, what does this boat have to do with the arthroscope? Well, really, the boat has nothing to do with the arthroscope, but, but this boat may, by the end of the talk, uh, have something to do with arthroscopy. This boat is a model of the America. It's three and three quarters inches long. It's a half inch wide. It draws about one millimeter of glue. It has three square inches of sail, and I, I, I built it uh, for about $9.95 out of balsa wood, toothpicks, pins, and thread when I was setting this talk up. Now this is a triumph of technology over reason, building this, this ship. Uh, it, it has no real purpose. It's a copy of all the design ideas that went along with the America, uh, and it fits in a bottle. But besides that, there's really nothing to this boat that's uh, spectacular. Well, you can think about arthroscopy in some ways and wonder if arthroscopy is in fact itself a triumph of technology over reason. Uh, arthroscopy sort of started in 1931. Uh, a man named Berman uh, started to perform uh, very small camera studies in cadavers. And uh, after this, uh, not until 1950, did an actual arthroscope that could be used in, in human beings was it developed. It was developed by a Japanese surgeon named Watanabe. He developed a, a scope that he called the number 21, and it was really the, the mainstay for arthroscopic treatment uh, up until the 1970s. Well, up until then, treatment was really examination. There were very few indications for the arthroscope. Uh, you could take a look around the shoulder joint, something we call diagnostic arthroscopy, and just sort of see the lay of the land. You could occasionally find and remove a, a loose fragment of bone or a piece of cartilage that was stuck in the joint. Um, and they started working on developing different portals or different regions of the shoulder that were safe to get into with instruments. But by and large, there was very little that you could do with the arthroscope. By the mid-80s, the indications for arthroscopy were starting to grow a little bit. Uh, people were treating shoulder dislocations with it. People were treating impingement syndrome or that rubbing of, uh, against the bony roof above the shoulder with it. Uh, people were trying to treat rotator cuff tears with it. But the results initially were pretty discouraging compared to the traditional techniques at the time which had developed into mini open techniques. Well, what are mini open techniques? The idea behind a mini open surgery is that rather than have a large surgery, a large incision and take down the muscles to get to the shoulder, that you'd create a small window or portal uh, just at the outside edge of the shoulder joint and through that portal you'd work on the rotator cuff. Now they got the, the, the ideas behind this down pretty sound to where people were actually able to fix cuffs reasonably well. I liken it to working it through the mouth of a bottle. It's a little difficult to get to where you need to get, but you can get there generally. If you need to work on the stem of the boat, if you need to work at the end that's close to the bottle, it's a pretty simple thing to do. The problem is that rotator cuffs tend to atrophy and the tears as they progress tend to start to pull away from the end of the cuff that's most accessible. So here we can see this is where when someone first tears their cuff the way the cuff might sit. But as time develops, if they haven't had it fixed and if it's becoming a problem, if, if, it, if they continue to do forceful things that are painful and they're continuing to work on the cuff or it just is neglected or not noticed, even if it's asymptomatic, what can happen is this cuff tear can pull back. Well, then this really does become like building a ship in a bottle. And the techniques that people did to, that do still to try and take care of this are basically to try and access this free cuff edge, to free the cuff up as much as possible from the, the muscles in the front and the muscles in the back. And the images that you're looking at are as if we're looking straight down at the rotator cuff from the top with all the other muscles around the shoulder removed. So we're basically looking down at the cuff. This is the front up here. This is the back back here. And this is the supraspinatus muscle, or the top rotator cuff muscle, if you will, coming across the top. And again, the idea is to reach in, to lasso this cuff edge, and to bring it out to where it's supposed to be out at the end of the, the bone on the humerus. Again, it's a lot like, and even after I, I built this ship for this talk, because I thought if I'm going to do this analogy, I better have at least tried to build a ship in a bottle. So I did. And I actually found that this analogy sort of holds. What happens when you build a ship in a bottle, I, I never knew this, but you actually build the ship outside the bottle, you make it so the sails can collapse, you put the ship inside the bottle, and then you actually pull up the rigging using this little string uh, or, or this foreline that you've got sitting here. So here's, here's this little America. I've built the thing entirely. I've collapsed down the sails. We can stick it in the bottle, and then I've got this string sticking out here off the end, and you can pull it up. And that's the same thing you do when you're doing a mini open cuff repair. You can reach in. You prepare the cuff edge, you tie your sutures to it, and you pull it to the edge where it needs to be and fasten it in place. So what's the problem? That seems to work pretty well. And frankly, the results have been pretty good up to date. Well, when you start talking about these larger cuff tears, can the ship be built in a bottle? 
If you have cuff atrophy that gets to here, no problem, you can get to it from, from the edge of the bottle. If the cuff starts to pull back to here, well now you're going to have to try and pull it out, but it's going to be under a little bit of tension as you do. Cuff tears like this, now we're looking at it reaching the cuff on the other side of the humeral head. So we're having to reach all the way across the shoulder joint to the area where the, the glenoid socket is to access this cuff. And that's just a hard thing to do. And it would be like trying to build a ship in a bottle working on the, the, the sail all the way in the back of the cuff working from this side of the bottle. And it's a difficult thing to do. This gives you a sense on this picture to the upper right about how tough it would be. I mean, this is the view I have from looking inside the bottle of the ship that's sitting right in front of us here when you're working from the edge. So imagine trying to work on the other side of the ship. Well, the failures in large cuff tears started to occur because people were lassoing the end of this cuff. They were trying to bring it to bone under tension and then hope that it would hold there. And unfortunately, many of these cuff tears in the larger cuffs just fail. As soon as the person puts their arm down, as soon as they try and work the cuff, the, the tissue, which has now been repaired under some tension, pulls away from the cuff and doesn't, doesn't work. And this is why, for these larger cuff tears, they really sort of became accepted as being irreparable. People started to say, I've got a tear that can't be fixed because it's just going to require too much or it can't be mobilized or can't be brought out to where it needs to insert at the end of the humerus. So the treatment of large cuff tears up until the mid-1990s, really the surgeon had three options. You could either give up and tell the person that, I'm sorry, it's a bad problem, your rotator cuff is irreparable. You could build the cuff on the outside, as you will, by taking down the muscles around the shoulder, building the cuff or trying to reconstruct it uh, with an, a large open surgery and then trying to put the muscles back. But the problem is that the complications of taking down the deltoid muscles and the larger muscles around the shoulder are devastating. So a lot of surgeons really try not to do these large open surgeries. The last thing you could do is repair the cuff under tension or pull that cuff edge out as far as you can get it and hope that it can heal there. Well, with the arthroscope and with arthroscopy and some of the new portals and things like that, there was a change in paradigm. And to give you a sense of it, I made a little video here of this ship that uh, we made in the bottle. And we're sort of taking a look at what you can do with a scope that's different. So if we come to the end of the bottle, we pull off the cork, and we take a peek, this is what you can do from outside the shoulder versus with the scope, you can pretty much get on deck, and if you need be, you could tighten up a line here or there, kind of take a look at the aft side, check and see my workmanship, we'll come underneath here, there's a couple barnacles there we should get rid of. You know, you can see an awful lot with the scope. And what's interesting is when you have global access uh, to the shoulder or to any joint with the scope, by being able to put multiple portals in or multiple regions where you're entering the joint, suddenly there's a lot of things, there's a whole new world that opens up in terms of what you can take care of. Well, the same thing holds true in the shoulder, and we'll take a little tour of the shoulder joint here. I'm going to show you a shoulder joint that actually has one of these partial undersurface, like the early beginnings of a cuff tear, and we'll point it out as we get there. We're going to start out on this shoulder, sort of looking at the socket. This is the top of the socket. We can't see the whole thing at one time. This is a, a, a tendon called the biceps tendon. It's one of the, the, the parts of the arm muscle that, that flexes your elbow, and one side of that biceps comes up and through the joint and actually attaches at the top of the socket. You can see here we're sort of pulling this biceps into the joint to check and see how it looks. Right here, this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, tendon that you see coming across the front of the joint is actually the subscap tendon. That is the, the rotator cuff muscle on the front of the joint. So we're looking from the back of the joint in and through to the front of the joint, and we're looking at the integrity of this tendon. And frankly, this is the way they look. This one looks pretty good. This is the humeral head over here. We can take a look at the ligaments of the shoulder joint that stabilize the shoulder and keep it from coming out. And what we're, we're taking a peek here, this is a metal probe that we use just to kind of take a peek around. These are the ligaments of the shoulder joint here. They surround the, the head of the humerus like a hammock to hold it up in the joint. Um, they come off of this tissue called the labrum, which is sort of like a gasket, if you will, around the front of the shoulder joint. If you've got a little camera inside somebody's shoulder, basically, from the front, it's the camera is coming in from the rear of the shoulder. Rear. Okay. And we're actually looking from the back across the shoulder joint to the front of the shoulder. So you're actually looking at the front of the shoulder. If I were to tap the person that I'm scoping here, about here on the front of their shoulder, we could actually see some deep, if I did it deep enough, you could okay. see finger indentations on the front wall right here where we're operating. 
So the, the, your, your probe thing and the camera are both coming The probe is coming the through the front. The probe is coming through the front. Yes, there are two portals here now. We've okay. got one portal in the back, which you can't see because we're looking through it. All right. We've got a second portal that's in the front, and that's where the probe is coming through. Sure. And thanks for asking the question because I, I, I take this for granted that this is fairly obvious, but it's not, I know. So again, this is the front of the shoulder joint out here. We're coming from the back of the shoulder joint, and we're looking at this socket. This is the back of the socket back here. This kind of flimsy tissue is normal. That's the back part of that labral tissue, if you will. This is the rotator cuff coming across the top here. We're sort of getting a peak. This is from all the way below. We're entering the area down here that's right at the armpit. We're looking from the back to the front, looking down. So essentially, this area right here, if we were to go through, you'd come right out at the armpit. So we're looking down from the inside of the shoulder joint. Continuing on, there's a little blood there. We'll kind of wash out a little squirt. The, the scope is actually looking through a fluid medium. So we're pumping arthroscopy fluid, which is like saline, into the joint. And we're also draining that fluid from the joint at the same time so the joint stays clear. Here's the cuff tear that I was telling you about. We're now looking at the edge of the humerus. So here's, this is the top of the humerus here. This is the edge where the cuff should be inserting. And just like in the diagram here where you see these, these frayed tissues starting to fall, this is exactly what you're seeing here. This is attrition. These tissues are, are weak. They're tired. They've been trying to pull. And as the cuff pulls, it's starting to rip like a, a worn rope or a boated anchor. And this is the top inside of the shoulder joint, inside the cuff where this is occurring. And these are tears occurring at the inside of the shoulder joint cuff. We just kind of use the probe to, to check things out here, take a peek, see what's going on. So again, this is that top cuff muscle of the supraspinatus. The, the cuff muscles at the back of the shoulder are actually behind us. We've come through them to get into the shoulder. And this is where they're inserting at the back of the head. And, and that's what we get. Well, rotator cuff tears from the inside of the shoulder joint take on a whole new appearance. This first image is just a still from the video that you just looked at. And again, here's the head. Here are these attritional fibers that are giving way. This is what it looks like inside the shoulder joint. If we move the scope above the rotator cuff, so we're under the roof of the shoulder, but we're, we've come out of the shoulder and gone above the cuff, this is what we see there. This is the bony roof over the shoulder. I had placed a suture into the inside of the joint here so I could see where that cuff tear was. And then we can look on the outside of the cuff and see where that, that cuff tear was from the outside. And this is a relatively normal appearance. There's, the suture is coming right out of the cuff uh, from the inside. The second image is when you see the cuff tears that are starting to progress and they're starting to pull back a little more. We're looking at the same image right here, the top of the head. Now the cuff is no longer sort of inserting here. You can see the fibers where the cuff used to be, but it's sort of pulled off. And you can see this little area where the entire cuff has kind of pulled off at the top of the uh, head and has basically started to recede, just like you see in the picture here. Again, if we step outside the cuff and look from the top, what we see is this little hole. Here's the cuff. I've got a suture through the cuff. I'm actually looking into the joint down here, and this is the bony roof over the cuff here. When they get to be massive, and the cuff tear has pulled back all the way to the level of the glenoid. Well, now looking at the top of the head, and again, this is the same view here, the same view here. This is another patient, the same view here. The entire cuff is absent from its insertion here. It's just nowhere to be found. Where do you find it? Well, if you look to the inside into the joint, here's the cuff. It's pulled back all the way to where the socket is. The head has no coverage anymore. The cuff is completely pulled back away from where the head is. From, from where it needs to be attached at the end of the head. Clearly, this cuff, questionably this cuff, and probably not this cuff, are causing significant problems with the shoulder. Well, the real advantage of arthroscopy and the real revolution in all this uh, came from this shift in paradigms about how to actually fix these cuff tears. The initial discouraging results with trying to fix the cuff tears using the scope and the, the, the discouraging results of doing these procedures open was that we were trying to pull the cuff out from here and get this point all the way out to the bone here, and it was under too much tension and it failed. Well, people started thinking, what if you just sewed this thing up like a tent flap or sewed it up like a zipper and started bringing one end of the cuff here to this end here and gradually brought it together and covered the cuff? Well, and, and covered the head. Well, that's exactly what we can do. It's hard to do if you're working from way out here, like through a bottleneck. 
but it's very easy to do if you're standing inside the shoulder, uh, as it were, with the arthroscope. And that's exactly this, this technique, which is called margin convergence, that has allowed us to fix some of the really huge cuff tears uh, that occur in the shoulder. This is uh, some pictures of this actually in process. So what we're seeing here, again, just to give you some bearings, we're looking sort of at the aft of the ship. This is the socket part of the ball and socket joint of, of the, humor, of the uh, shoulder. This is a little glimpse of the head right here. There's that biceps tendon that comes across. The rotator cuff has pulled to where it's all the way at the socket. It should be in our way. We should not be able to look from the bony roof of the uh, that's over the shoulder into the joint. There should be a rotator cuff in our way, but it's not in our way, it's pulled back. So what we do is we use special instruments to pass sutures from one side of this to the other side of it and start to close it down piece by piece, stitch by stitch, until now, from the exact same view here as here, we've now closed the cuff between the top of the head and the, the joint itself. So ironically, it always sort of strikes me as being interesting when people come and say, you know, I've been told that my problem is too bad to be treated with the scope, or I've been, I've been told, uh, you know, that this, this is something that needs to be done open because it's a big problem. But I actually think that the real argument is that the biggest problems are the ones that we should be using the scope at least to address partially, okay? Well, what's the rub? I mean, what's the problem? with shoulder arthroscopy and why isn't it the, the main standard? Well, the problem, and there are problems, have to do with the way that we actually fix this cuff down once we get it approximated and in the right spot. And the sort of classic way to do this is to actually make tunnels through the bone and suture the cuff directly to the bone using these bone tunnels. But that is a very difficult thing to do through the arthroscope. So what we've devised are these series of devices, and these are all essentially the same device made by different manufacturers called a suture anchor. And I'm not carrying the analogy too far. That's actually what these are called, suture anchors. But what these suture anchors do is you create a hole in the cuff and actually screw the anchor down into the bone, just like a molly bolt in drywall. And all that sticks out is the suture that's left at the top of the anchor. And then that suture is what's used to tie down the cuff. Well, the problem with this is that, one, it's very difficult to do. Um, and not g getting the cuff together is, is tough, but also actually getting the sutures passed and sort of keeping all these threads and sutures and all the rigging, if you will, straight while you're trying to get it down can be a problem for surgeons. The second thing is that once you get it down, you tie these knots that are frequently fairly prominent on top of the cuff, and these can be somewhat uh, symptomatic. People can complain a little bit, at least for a short while, about the knots. Now, some substances dissolve and some don't. And uh, there's a whole list of things that would be very technical and hard to get into, but the bottom line is it's still not as perfect as having bone tunnels when you suture it down. The, the, the anchors, as I said, are not as strong as uh, bone tunnels. The bulky knots can cause symptoms. Some of the suture anchors are made of absorbable plastics that lose their strength over time, so it's kind of a race between the cuff healing down on its own and the anchor dissolving. And really, the only function of these anchors and the idea behind this surgery is that you've got to hold down the cuff while your own healing occurs. These anchors are not they shouldn't be providing any stability after about 12 to 16 weeks. What happens is they just hold the cuff in place, your body heals the cuff, then your body's doing all the work, the anchor's just a decoration, and that's what's nice about the absorbable anchors is they kind of go away. The bottom line, though, is that you can't rush Mother Nature. And so one of the, the sort of false things about arthroscopy is it doesn't speed your healing. Patients may feel better, but that's actually a bad thing, I think, in some ways. If you have a big open surgery and you make a lot of big incisions, people hurt, and therefore they don't move the cuff when you're trying to get it to heal down. If you do an arthroscopic procedure, it's small incisions. People feel better a lot quicker than they're actually healed. So patients probably need to be protected even longer after they have an arthroscopic procedure. Also, everyone talks about, well, I had arthroscopy. If I'm going to have arthroscopy, I'm going to have tiny little incisions. It's true, each incision is quite small, but if you think about it, I've told you just to look at the shoulder and examine it, about two incisions, one in the back and one in the front. Now if we're talking about fixing the cuff, you might end up with a couple more on the side, one in the front, around the side. It gives us perfect access to the cuff, but if you add up the length of all these tiny little incisions, it probably wouldn't be that much different than a mini open. The difference is that you can do things that you can't do from the mouth of the bottle. 
So how do these things actually compare with traditional surgery? Well, across the boards, if you look at all the different studies, and I'm going to look, I concentrate mostly on studies that are more recent because I, I think that this is developed as a technology. So the more recent studies are probably telling us somewhat more about where the, the state of the art stands now. People get about 93% to 95% good or excellent results with arthroscopic cuff repairs. What's interesting is that there's not much difference in the results depending on the, the, the tear size. Now what I mean by that is with the old way of doing things, the mini open repair, people who had small tears traditionally did great, people who had big tears did not as great. With arthroscopy, people with small tears do pretty well and people with really huge tears do pretty well. There's not a big difference from one tear size to the other. The rear re-tear rates are higher with arthroscopy in some of the studies that are out. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the people are very satisfied with their surgery and have it again, but if you get an MRI on their shoulder, they still have a small cuff tear. So again, we get back to the stage where we're probably restoring the function of the cuff with some of these techniques, but maybe not exactly getting it to heal down all the way, and that probably is going to be a problem we solve as we get better fixation methods to the bone. The last thing is that the long-term durability of these cuff repairs is just not known. You know, we know how the, the way we did it 10 years ago lasted, and we know how the way we did it one year ago lasted, but I can't tell you if the way we did it one year ago or we're doing it now is going to last for 10 years. And so those results are still cooking, if you will. I think, though, if you ask people who'd been told by their surgeons or told by other people or suffered with shoulder pain for a long time, how some of these arthroscopic methods work out, I think they'd tell you they were pretty happy. You're looking here at three patients uh, who I've done not too uh, distantly who are doing great. These folks all had these massive rotator cuff tears. They were told that they were inoperable. People looked at the MRIs and just kind of ran away and said, well, you're going to just have to let the shoulder kind of go to pot and then eventually have a, an arthroplasty done. And uh, arthroplasty being a, a shoulder replacement done uh, if the shoulder breaks down. But, but again, using these kind of painstaking uh, uh, ways, you can sew these cuffs up. And I think if you can get people a fair bit of time and a functional shoulder that allows them to do the things they like to do, we've sort of won the race, so to speak. So I'd like to say thanks a lot, and I'll take any questions you folks have. Do athletes who, uh, who suffer this kind of uh, injury, they have arthroscopic surgery, uh, do they get back to the same level of activity that they were used to? Or? It's a great question. And it, it, it's complex, but the general answer is yes. Between about 85 and 95% of people who have a rotator cuff tear fixed arthroscopically will get back to the same or a higher level of competition. Um, this depends on several issues, and it's a bit of a loaded question, only because the, the shoulder that gets a rotator cuff tear, there, unless it was a traumatic injury, there, there's probably a secondary reason why this is happening. And it's, it's, it, it can be difficult to, and, and it's important that the surgeon figures out uh, and solves all the issues that are leading to the cuff tear. Uh, and those are the things that can prohibit people from getting back. But in general, uh, the answer to the question is that it's a successful surgery and that people get back Although the codicil to that question, and, and you haven't asked it, but I think people are wondering is, are they getting back quicker? And as we've answered before, I don't think you actually get back quicker. I wouldn't do an arthroscopic procedure because I thought I was going to get someone on the field quicker. But I would do it because I think that I can do a better job through the scope with, with a particular type of surgery. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here and sitting through this. And if there are questions that you want to ask that you didn't want to ask in front of other people, I'll be here for a few minutes to answer those sort of questions as well. Mm -hmm.